Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. And today we're going to talk about more Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American scholar, and before we do that, though, if you're interested in the stuff we do, go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash OGB podcast and join the VIP waiting list. And then uh, next time we open in enrollment, you'll get 25% off because you listen to our show and we care about you. And uh, you'll also get the first shot at those uh, slots when they come open. So go do that. And it would be mighty helpful if you went to iTunes and gave us a review too, a good review. So if you like to show... Take a moment, you know, when you're looking at your phone and you're on the toilet, <laughs> you could just go to iTunes and just give us a, a little review and drop a few lines about uh, how the show has been helpful to you. I wanted to say that's the best you've ever read that ad copy. You got through that seamlessly. Thank you. That was very good. That was like professional. I never get the URL right, guys. <laughs> yeah, that was perfect. Oh, we had a really nice review, Carl. I think I sent it to you where Camille on iTunes said, five stars, listening to Scott and Carl's banter while working on a puzzle has become a favorite pastime. I've been listening for uh-huh. several months and mostly with a deaf ear. <laughs> <laughs> she says, due to her un- unfounded insecurities, that she wouldn't understand what they were talking about due to the types of books. But the Lord of the Rings podcast made her fall in love with these guys, and now she's reading the books, and she's going back and listening to the previous podcast. That's perfect. Thanks. This is the day before Thanksgiving, so this is our... We're podcasting a day early uh, mm-hmm. to make room for celebrating the holiday, and probably it's appropriate for Thanksgiving, which is an American holiday, to go back to... One of these great, big, important American thinkers, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Yeah, we did did a show not too long ago about his his essay, Self-Reliance, and uh, that is the one in which Hambrick cries and cries and cries. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I think I can get through this one dry-eyed, although there's a line or two in here that are pretty tough on me. Yeah, so we're going to do The American Scholar, which my copy of the book says delivered at Cambridge in 1837 uh, before the Harvard chapter of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. And so this is an early talk given to American scholars, and it's kind of a challenge to them. And I thought it would be good to read because it's, at least on the surface, a challenge to what we do at All Nine Great Books. Plus, Emerson is worth reading. He's kind of florid sometimes, do you know? Right. He's poetic. Uh, So he's talking about this meeting that they're having it's a nice party, but mostly it's just been a party. Perhaps the time is already come when it ought to be and will be something else, when the sluggard intellect of this continent will look from under its iron lids and fill the postponed expectation of the world with something better than exertions of mechanical skill. Yeah. That's a good line, but it's a, <laughs> it's Emersonian. Yeah, we were already famous for that Yankee ingenuity, you know, that mechanical skill. Right. I wonder if Ben Franklin was the first famous American. Probably. And he was famous for... Everything. Lightning and the Franklin stove and bifocals. He was a tinkerer. And his diplomacy. Yeah. And his drinking. And his womanizing. Yep, and his womanizing. Yeah, he was uh, he's quite a character. Yeah, we ought to read his stuff eventually. So it's a challenge to the American scholar. So that's these young men. What is it they ought to be doing? Well, they need to be creating a unique and new American tradition of letters. Yeah. We've long apprenticed to that old continent and the learning of old and brought forth on this, na- on this continent a new nation. And, and there's a new type of intellect here, a new type of individual, I think, that uh, Emerson is describing. And then from that individual, there should be a new tradition of letters arise. Yeah, so I... The main thought that I got from this that I that I like, there's a bunch of gold in this little essay. Emerson has a reverence for work, a reverence for the common man, the people who do stuff, which really struck me. He says, um, this is like the fourth or fifth paragraph, 
You must take the whole society to find the whole man. Man is not a farmer or a professor or an engineer, but he is all. Man is a priest, scholar, statesman, a producer, and soldier. And the problem is, the whole man is the whole society taken as one. The difficulty with the scholar is he may end up just being a mere scholar, a mere thinker. And in order to do it, he says somewhere else in here, you have to do action and that the deeds that you do are your vocabulary. And I, I thought that was very interesting because there's always a temptation. If you're, if you're a thinker kind of guy, if, if you're up in your head all the time, I think you can lose touch. You're missing something. Well, that's the thing. I'm going to make the air quotes thing. That's the thing that bothers normal people about academia. Mm-hmm. There's a sort of bloodlessness in that rarefied thought. They're like hothouse flowers. Like they're kept. Yeah. They're kept by their tenure, and their well, <laughs> their nutrition's delivered to them. <laughs> and, and they think about stuff that doesn't matter. Yeah. Usually, if you read academic writing, especially academic writing about philosophers and and literary people, it's Socrates is in the street talking to people, confronting them, bothering them you know, talking about things that matter, but the scholarship on Plato might be about the instance of a particular Greek particle in the, in, in the original Greek, you know, who cares, you know, somebody cares, but most of us don't. Most of us want to know is what he says, true, good, and beautiful. Does it have anything to do with me? I, I like what Aristotle says, you know, his, his complaint about Plato, does the idea of good do any good to the farmer, to the carpenter? And if it doesn't, you're probably gone a little too far. So it's it's a degenerate state when you are a mere thinker. So I want to read the quote. In the ge- degenerate state, when the victim of society, he tends to become a mere thinker, or still worse, the parrot of other men's thinking. Ugh. So, Carl, you said this thing where he says, you must take the whole society to find the whole man. Mm-hmm. And then he lists this, the priest, the scholar, da 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 yeah. I kind of thought this was like the Republic, where to find justice, you know, he looks at what the perfect state would be so he can find out what it is for the individual, right? Mm-hmm. When I was reading this, I thought, you know, can we flip this like Plato would have? If the man is divided and is too specialized, can he be whole? Because later, later on he says that a man, if he's sent out into the field to gather food, he's seldom cheered by any idea of the true dignity of his ministry, and he sees the bushel in his cart and sinks into the farmer instead of man on the farm. Yeah, that's a nice phrase. He be- Did I make myself clear there? Like, is there an injunction against specialization in this thing? I think so. I think so. The farmer ought not to just be mere farmer, an economic unit. So help me tidy up what I was saying there. <laughs> can you say it better than I can? Maybe. I don't know. I want to tell you a story. So we were talking about this before we went on the air. Uh, I have a daughter who is a harpist. Uh, She's a beginning harpist, and she has outgrown her harp. And uh, we happen to have in Chicago, we have many things in Chicago, both for good and for ill, but one of the things we have is the factory of one of the two big harp makers in the world, Salvi and Lion and Healy. We have Lion and Healy in Chicago on Ogden. It's just west of the city. It's worth a visit to take the tour every day at noon when they're open. And Mm. so we went in, we took the tour. We ended up, harps are expensive, that's a problem, but... You know, she better be good. She needs to start making the money back. (laughs) It's like she needs to go do some gigs. But uh, so there's five stories. There's five floors in this building. It's an old industrial building. And you start the tour on floor one, two, three, four, and five. And on one, there's a bunch of workmen, ordinary guys, mostly guys, gluing big chunks of wood together. And then they take it up to the next level. And they take this wood and they're shaping it into the rough form and, and making the soundboard and, and bending the laminate around it and everything. They take it up another floor. Uh, they do carving. Oh, the first floor, they're doing the linkages. There's a very complicated mechanical thing that goes on in a pedal harp. Oh, a pedal harp. All these people doing it. It's, it's, it's neat. Um, you get to the top floor, they're, they're carving the wood. They're carving like really artistic designs on these things. You can spend as much money on a harp as you want. And they have like the Louis the Fifteenth, which is a quarter of a million dollars. I think they've sold three of them. <laughs> you know, they'll make one for you if you want it. But the people that are doing the artistry on these harps are not the sort of people 
that you would think of when you think of a harp. You think of like Harpo Marx. Well, Harpo Marx, but he's exactly the sort of person that would have been in the factory, right? I know. That's why he's I love an him. ordinary Joe. Uh, but you think of like the, it's always girls, women that play the harp, and they're always in the, the long hair and the flowing dress, and it's very, it's very hoity toity. But none of the people that are making it are like that. I was hearing, I'm from Chicago or from the area. I was hearing my native accent, the guy giving the tour. He speaks my language. I don't often slip into it, but he speaks my language. It, it's all um, just artisans. I don't want to say just artisans. Artisans making this beautiful thing. I was thinking about Emerson the whole time I was there. Because this is sort of like in the factory, in the five levels of the factory, is the whole man that he's talking about, which is not merely a carver of wood or not merely even the artist who plays the harp. It's the whole thing. Everybody had to work to make the... It takes them eight months to make a harp. The Louis the Fifteenth might take a, a year and a half. Better get your order in. Right. <laughs> Act now. <laughs> These are ordinary people. They got pictures of their kids. You know, they have their, their calendar from their church. All that stuff's in their workspace. They're just ordinary people like you'd see anywhere making the most beautiful harps in the world. And so... If you think of the harp being performed on a stage as the peak of human culture, well, it didn't get there. All of these people were part of it. Have you ever heard the uh, Milton Friedman story about no one knows how to make a pencil? Yeah, it, that, you can see that on YouTube. Yeah. Friedman's talking about the pencil and all the, the detail that goes in to make you have a pencil in your hand. There has to be mining expertise, metallurgy, forestry, paint. You have to get the rubber. Chemistry, rubber, like so many different skills go into that. And he says that the society has to have all of these different kinds of people in it to have a, I guess, let me say, a, a healthy intellectual product from the mm -hmm. society. But when I was reading that and I got to that next thing, next line, I was like, the individual needs to contain the multitudes too. Yeah. So his example is the farmer. Yeah. You'd hate to be the farmer and think all you're doing is you're an economic unit and your life is just this row that you're hoeing. But you're contributing to everybody else in the society that's doing all the beautiful things. And without you, they can't do any of it. Emerson wants him to be, capital M, man on the farm, not a farmer. Yeah. I really like that. And this is the, these guys that are gluing up this wood, you know, on floor, first floor, wood gluing. Uh, the guys on the first floor gluing that stuff up, you know, I want them to be whole, complete people who are yeah. in that time contributing to the harp. Yeah. The neatest thing, it was like that whole pencil story in one building. Yeah. That's the thing. Except they didn't go chop the wood down and age it. They get the lumber and then they make it. Uh, and so at the top end, you have the same problem. So it's not just the farmer. I'm saying top and bottom, you know. I don't mean much by that. But the thinker, the scholar, these Harvard kids from 1837, they can become abstracted too from the whole of humanity. They can be the mere thinker. Emerson says, the man on the farm can be thought of as farmer. The priest becomes a form, the attorney, a statute book, the mechanic, a machine, the sailor, the rope of a ship. And he doesn't want the scholar to become thought. He wants them to be man thinking. And then mm -hmm. he goes on later to say that man thinking really probably needs to be everyone. Yeah. All right. So what are the difficulties. Where should we look? He's got his numbers in my copy of the essay. In yeah. the first place is nature. Yeah, he's talking about what sources of knowledge or and or inspiration. And the first one of those is not, is nature. Yeah, this is a bit of the transcendentalism of yeah. Emerson. Somehow nature and humanity, they mirror each other. And so if you want to know yourself, he says this at the end of that section. The ancient precept, know thyself, and the modern precept, study nature, become at last one maxim. The beauty of nature is the beauty of your own mind. Yeah. Go for a hike. <laughs> Get out of the city. Go look at stuff. He says that the nature and the mind, he says, one is seal and one is print. They're mirror images of each other, he says. And I wrote down here a question here for Carl. Hmm. Okay. For, for Emerson, do you think beauty exists separate of humans? Like there's a sunrise and there aren't any people. <laughs> I think it's an absolute good, beautiful, and true, whether you're here, we're here to see it or not. But for Emerson, I don't think that's true. 
I think he requires a I think he requires a mind to decode it and to take it in. If we're right about Emerson, I, I think I probably agree with Emerson. Truth is being as known, good is being as perfective of something. Beauty would be being as delightful, but it needs to be delightful to somebody. In the abstract it isn't. It's still bees whether or not you there to look at it. Yeah, but if nobody's looking at it, it's not beautiful. Beauty's in, this is my opinion, beauty's in a mind. And for Emerson too. Yeah, so it's minds all the way down, right? So it's a, the mind of God, the mind of us, the mind of anything else that has a mind, if yeah. there are such things. I actually agree with that, brought that question for me. It was like, I wanted to clarify for myself. I wanted to dig Emerson up and just put that one to him. I was listening to I had to wait for the tour, so I was listening to my daughter play harp music. The music doesn't exist, and it kind of exists on the page, but it doesn't really exist until she plays it and I hear it. Mm -hmm. um, that's a way to think about that. You said that this is transcendental, and it is, but maybe not. Like there's a there's a guy, there's a cat that I like. He's dead now. His name's John. <laughs> he's John Senior. He was at the University of Kansas many moons ago, and put together their classics program, which they've since dismantled. And mm -hmm. of course they did. Yeah, of course they did. And uh, he wrote, he wrote a number of books. Uh, and one of his students who is an abbot at a monastery, Prior Bethel wrote a book about John senior and he named it the restoration of realism. And John senior, John senior was very worried in the seventies that we were being divorced from realism and he he thought it had serious consequences for the educability of people if they're divorced from reality they don't go outside they don't fall out of trees and stuff it makes it harder to learn carl's frowning at me so no actually i was leaning back in mm. case i burped into the oh, okay <laughs> uh, so so uh, emerson says about nature this is me when a child observe it observes nature the blank mind, if there is such a thing, observes nature. Classification begins. To the young mind, everything is individual and stands by itself. By and by, it finds out how to, it finds how to join two things and see them in one nature, then three, then 3,000, and so on. Tyrannized over by its own unifying instinct, it goes on tying things together, diminishing anomalies, discovering out of one stem. It presently learns blah, blah, blah. So he talks about how observing nature and interacting with nature interacts with the mind and vice versa. Like this is mm -hmm. how people learn. They throw rocks and collect leaves and this is how it happens. And if we not if we're not rooted in that, uh, one of the major tools for the formation of the the mind is gone. We did uh, Aristotle I think mm -hmm. last week and he says a similar thing that you can't do ethics unless you have a store of good actions that you've done. That's the data upon which your mind works. You need to see stuff. And Emerson, I think, would agree with this. You need to do things yep. to have things to categorize. He says, from perceiving these objects that the astronomer eventually discovers that geometry, a pure abstraction of the human mind, is a measure of planetary motion, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's just lovely. He says, science, I like this. And all you scientists out there need to take note. Science is nothing but the finding of analogy, identity in the most remote parts. Science isn't anything, guys. <laughs> it's an organizing principle that helps us hold reality in our minds when it's at its best. It doesn't give rules for living? No, it does not. <laughs> That's shocking. It's a heuristic. It's a way of investigating, thinking about, and holding what is true in the mind. Yeah. Is your daughter's harp sheet music science? Because it's not music. No, not until she plays it. It's a symbolic representation. Because the periodic table ain't chemistry. Well, that's true. Yeah. You know, all this stuff we call about science is just the card catalog of the world. You know, it's how we reference stuff. But it all starts with nature. Yeah. Let's go to point number two. Point number two. The great influence in the spirit of the scholar. The next great influence in the spirit of the scholar is the mind of the past. This is what we do at Online Great Books. <laughs> the, the, we're reading a lot of the mind of the past. Now, there's some warnings for us. I, I, want, I want to read a passage. Can we read that first whole paragraph first? 
Well, I was going to read the second whole paragraph, so take your pick. Well, let's read them both. <laughs> <laughs> the next great influence into the spirit of the scholar is the mind of the past in whatever form, whether of literature, of art, of institutions, that mind is inscribed. Books are the best type of the influence of the past, and perhaps we shall get at the truth. Learn the amount of this influence more conveniently by considering their value alone. Okay. The theory of books is noble. The scholar of the first age received into him the world around, brooded thereon, gave it the new arrangement of his own mind, and uttered it again. It came to him life. It went out from him truth. I could just stop there. I just love that. It came into him life and it went out from him truth. Uh, so good. So uh, Plato walked around and experienced 5th century Athens and 4th century Athens and out of him came his writing. Brooded thereon. Yes. That's what they do. It's like a divine regurgitation. Because the mind for Emerson is divine. It requires the human mind probably to make it truth. For him, Emerson, he yeah. says, it came to him short-lived actions and went out from him immortal thoughts. It came to him business and went from him poetry. It was dead fact. Now it is quick thought. It can stand and it can go. It now endures. It now flies. It now inspires. Precisely in proportion to the depth of the mind from which it issued, so high does it soar, so long does it sing. Yeah, and right next to that, I put in brackets. Beautiful. It's just wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the activity of the mind... Just like the activity of the farmer deserves some reverence. It's not a small thing to look at the world and give it a shape. You know, Shakespeare is a big deal. Yeah. But again, you have to look at the world for the product of the mind to be legitimate for Emerson. Otherwise, it's disembodied thought. Right. This is what I, when I was reading this a while back, uh, I read it before I read reread Self Reliance when we did that podcast, and I thought, well, this is a bit of a challenge to us. Okay, so we read old books, and there is a danger in the old book. So this is uh, two paragraphs down. Henceforward, it is settled the book is perfect, as love of the hero corrupts into worship of, of his statue. Instantly, the book becomes noxious. The guide is a tyrant. We sought a brother, and lo, a governor. Uh, it is possible that you take the books in the wrong way as settled, mm -hmm. as something that you don't need to think about, as PowerPoint. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, memorize the... Uh, I had to do PowerPoint once for a job interview for at a university. I had to do PowerPoint on P Socrates. That ain't, that <laughs> ain't an, okay. It was an abomination. <laughs> you can't do it because... The PowerPoint, you're you're so receptive. You just sit there and you look at it. It's like it's an authority. It looks very impressive. It's got bullet points and, and like transitions and stuff. <laughs> and you're not prepared to chew on it and spit it out or, or to remake it however you need it. The book can be a tyrant. He says at the end of that very paragraph, no, just before that, he says, each age it is found must write its own books. The books of an older period will not fit this. Well, which is it, Ralph? Yeah. The mind of the past, whether the literature, the art institutions, the mind is inscribed. The which is it, dude? <laughs> well. I think it's both and, right? Yeah, I think it's both and. I think there's a right way to read this stuff. I do too. And I hope that we're doing it. You said that this might run contrary or challenge our project, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. You know, I, I did office hours the last Wednesday of the month. I do. I call it office hours. I just turn on Zoom and any of the online great books, people that want to come can come and we can talk about whatever they want. We can talk about what they're reading, any problems that, you know, come up in the program, whatever, anything at all. I just want to make myself available. And there was a guy in there named Josh. And I said, what kind of podcast you listen to? He says, well, mostly agribusiness. Cool. Yeah, that guy's in no danger of getting subsumed by these old books. He's going to layer them on top of the work he does with the soil. Mm -hmm. He's not going to enshrine those things because he's going to mash his thumb hooking up a three-point uh, hitch, you know, with his tractor, and it's going to bring him right back to the world. He's probably a bit older, right? Yeah. yeah. He's so he's not an 18-year-old <laughs> kid. He's my age. <laughs> yeah. So he's a young man is what you're saying. He's probably 45 years old. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Socrates is one of my favorite people in all of history, and it is 
one of my favorite parts of the seminar when somebody comes in and says, I can't stand this guy. Yeah. <laughs> the 18 year olds never said that to me. They took it passively. Most of them, not all of them. It's more fun when you fight with it. It's more fun when you, it's better for you if you realize that Plato's just a guy just like you. And so uh, at the end of the paragraph, meek young men grow up in libraries believing it their duty to accept the views which Cicero, which Locke, which Bacon have given, forgetful that Cicero, Locke, and Bacon were only young men in libraries when they wrote these books. Um, They're just like you. They're probably smarter than you. But they're wrestling with the same problems, and you can wrestle with them. It's all right. Be man thinking, not the bookworm. Yeah, so what we do, a big part of what we do is the seminar. It's not just shipping you a book list and, and the books every month. That's nothing. You know, you could do that on your own. Good luck to you. But what we do is we have you come in for seminars where you have to talk about the thing. And you can't be passive because if you are passive, I'm going to ask you questions and do my best to annoy you or any of our other people who run the seminars. Carl, you don't ask me enough questions. <laughs> I should ask more? I don't know. But you can't just say, well, Plato said this. Well, for one thing, Plato never says anything. But you can't just, you can't read him like that. Yeah. It's an appeal of a mind to another mind, and you're the other mind. Our friend Emmett Penny, who's a Johnny. Yes. St. John's guy. He says that the close reading is done in the seminar. Yeah, I think that's right. And I say, let me quote myself. <laughs> the seminar is where you take action on what you've read. The seminar is where you start to incorporate the book into the self. And the seminar is where you dodge the bullet of potentially becoming a bookworm. Mm-hmm. You also have to sit and think about it. You have to have some moments of contemplation. Uh, I'm trying to find the quote. I have it written down. I just read it. Uh, Let it receive from another mind its truth, though it were in torrents of light, without periods of solitude, inquest, and self-recovery, and a fatal disservice is done. Uh, You have to have time. So you read the thing, and then you think about the thing. Yeah, let's rephrase what he said. You receive the work from the other mind, and then let's make this a positive injunction. And then you must undertake periods of solitude, questioning, and self-recovery. You have to find yourself in relationship to what you've read in order to avoid just receiving that genius and being subsumed by it. Right. And here's the bad example, he says. The literature of every nation bears me witness. The English dramatic poets have Shakespeareized now for 200 years. Yeah, so you go write something Shakespeare-esque. It's hard not to do. Yeah. Actually, I would be really happy if I could do that. If you could do that, well, yeah. Well, there's some thoughts about that. Imitation is not horrible. I, so I suppose I would disagree a little bit. There was a, a, a saxophone player named Sonny Stitt who sounded a whole lot like Charlie Parker. I think he might have played on the Clint Eastwood movie Bird to play some of the Charlie Parker parts. And I heard this story that somebody was sitting in the audience and listened to him play and then said to him, man, you're just you're just copying Charlie Parker. And Sonny handed him the saxophone and said, if you think it's so easy, you do it. <laughs> you know, to play like a genius or to write poetry like Shakespeare, if you can really do it, it's pretty good. Yep. It's pretty good. Uh, But on the other hand, there's more than mere imitation. So I was mentioning Harold Bloom. He he has this theory that it's agonistic, that the canon is always somebody trying to one-up somebody else. Shakespeare did this. Well, let me do something else. I can do better. Agonistic, right? That's like from the the Aegon, the struggle. Is that what that means? Yeah. So your antagonist is the one fighting against you. The protagonist would be the one fighting for you, I guess. But they're both fighting. They're both agonists. The word agony is related to it. So I, I'm not so down on imitation. Imitation is pretty good. It's how you learn to be an artist. Yeah, you have to imitate before you can be original, I think. That's all I do. It'd be a good thing to have an original thought. <laughs> I'm not sure I've had one. That's a tall order. You know, there's uh, maybe there's 7 billion people on Earth now, and there have been more that have gone before us. I've looked at it before. You know, people have done some math. 
there's probably another 20 billion or something like that maybe that have proceeded. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been some pretty smart cookies there. That's a lot of computing cycles, you know, some 28 billion conscience, consciousnesses. Um, and if to come up with something original is just extraordinary. And I'll tell you, one of the things that irritates me about academia is there is a drive to come up with something original to be published, right? Yes. Well, you could come up with some original stuff, but it's probably going to be word salad. I can say something original that nobody's ever said before, but the chances are it won't make any sense. Uncovering a hard truth, almost impossible at this point. And I think it's probably contrary. Let me rephrase that. I think it's definitely contrary to the original idea of philosophy. Philosophy's love of wisdom. It's also care of the soul. Mm. It's not being new. It's uh, men of Athens, says Socrates, I love you and respect you, but I will never cease exhorting you to uh, love the higher things rather than the lower. That's what philosophy is about. You don't write academic papers on that. It's done person by person in encouraging people to think beyond the mere appearances. Encouraging people to think, which brings us to point three. Yeah. He, he well, says we have to access the minds, the mind of the past. And then in part three, he says that the true scholar, the man thinking, must be a man of action. Yeah. Is that how you would paraphrase that? I think that's right. You know, I asked a question of your other podcast. Mm. I remember a while back. And it was about entrepreneurship. And I always feel like I'm naturally kind of a sidekick. And so hanging around with you and Reynolds, you're people that go out and start businesses and do stuff. It's a little harder for me. I think I'm pretty good saying, hey, that's a great idea. Let me help. But not so much the, the pioneer. I think it's something essential and impressive and needed that you have to actually do stuff. That it's, you know, go start the business. Go try something. This is the, the part of the self-reliance essay that gets you choked up is encouraging the young man to go and, and do stuff. To sit and think is to be a mere thinker. You know, I think that's, that's probably not, you're not a whole human being if all you do is sit and read academic articles. My goodness. Go get a job, you know? Carl, you're a man of action. I don't feel like one sometimes, but you know, there are a lot of people that have the love of wisdom that you have, and they're still back there at the university of what's happening now, and you struck out to do something new and uh, bring it to real life people. The guy listening to the agribusiness report. Yeah, well, I'm very proud of what we're doing at Online Great Books. People choose to come to us. They're not coming to us because they have to get a diploma to get a job. They're choosing to come to us, and we are reading this stuff and challenging them. Yeah, we have 500 and 500 something members right now who are dedicated to this. And I taught in college for 20 years and there were some students that were, but most weren't. Most were there because they had to be there and couldn't care less. Carl, your man thinking and doing, don't poop on it. Well, I'm trying. I'm trying. You got to do stuff. If nobody does anything, nothing happens. Did you hear that Marlboro College went belly up? Yes, I did. Yeah. You're welcome. Will anybody notice? Just me, because I'm keeping a death count. Uh, Marlboro College is a little liberal arts school in New England, and they um, couldn't keep their enrollments up enough to keep the doors open, and they ended up closing the doors, and they gave their properties and their small endowment to Emerson College, thereby staving off death for those folks for mm -hmm. some time, because these schools are no longer places of action. Right, or they're pl no, they're probably not places of man thinking. They're probably places of mere thinking. Right, mere thinking. Read the uh, read the right articles. Write the right papers. Get on the academic treadmill. Produce more stuff that nobody reads. Well, what's the final cause of these? I've been wanting to talk to you about this. I, I thought about doing a whole podcast about the metaphysics, not like the book, but just talk about regular things. Like, what's the final cause? What was the final cause for Marlboro College? It's probably issuing a credential and not educating. I never hung around up there. I don't know a lot about them. But I know for more and more schools, the final cause is not education. It's bestowing a social, a social 
rank Mm -hmm. and or a credential. Yeah, or you're joining a club of the people from that college. Yep. And it helps you in your life, supposedly. But the motto of Harvard is Veritas. And the joke is, now it's got a question mark after it. Right. Yeah, you you know I'm kind of down on that. I, I think we do more good... We do more good with our folks wrestling with with one of these books. Yeah. I'm on board. We had a fantastic Iliad seminar last night. Me being a barbell coach and wrestling with this badly <laughs> is better than somebody at Emerson College in their office wrestling with it well and keeping it under a lid. So there. Mm-hmm. Good Iliad seminar last night, you say? Yeah, just thrilling. Just a bunch of... I don't think they're regular Joes because they showed up with us, but just fantastic people, you know, trying to figure out. I always have them figure out the good guys and the bad guys, and then I make them argue for the bad guys. Yeah, that's the Carl shoot trick. So listen, guys. Yeah, so you know it coming in. You need to read these books yourself. You don't have to join us, although, you know, you ought to. But if you don't, get three or four of your friends together, or eight, and everybody go read the Iliad. And then this is how Carl will kick off his seminars. He'll say... (laughs) Who's your favorite character and who's your worst? And he makes every, or least favorite character, and he makes everybody name him. And then he says, oh, okay, so your least favorite character is Agamemnon, right? Yeah, that's right. I hate him. Okay, defend him. Tell us what's good about him. Yeah. And it's a great tool to start discussing the book. So get your buddies together. You guys read the first half of the Iliad and then do that exercise together. You'll be surprised what you come up with. You'll end up defending Agamemnon and Paris. And and you'll be man-thinking. Yep. Rather than thinking what everybody else already thinks about the book. Yep. Emerson wanted that to be the American project. And I know Adler did. Mm-hmm. Man-thinking. Carl, he's got something here awesome. That is awesome. Do tell. He says, the new deed is yet part of life and remains for a time immersed in our unconscious life. In some contemplative hour, it detaches itself from the life like a ripe fruit to become the thought of the mind, a thought of the mind. Instantly, it is raised, transfigured. The corruptible has put on incorruption. This is a really interesting thought. You know, we do things. So this is about action for him. We do things. And when you stop, doing the thing. And and then you're able to contemplate it. You convert that action and then that memory in just a pure thought at that point. Mm -hmm. And and then that's the process. You do, you contemplate, and then pure original thought comes from that. And it doesn't have to be original, like added onto the end of the great canon. It's yours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what I really like about Emerson is, I, I think I said at the beginning of this, is the amount of reverence he has for everybody. So if you think the mind is something divine, which I think he does, you know that means that everybody has divinity, however you want to think about that, which means that that farmer out in the field who notices something and has a a neat thought out in the field, that is a glorious thing. There's 7 billion people. There's 7 billion perspectives. There's 7 billion uh, ways of seeing the world. Some of them are going to be really neat, and all of them are yours. And so when we have people come to us, we, we say this over and over again, you are sufficient to the task. You can read this stuff. These people did not write for academics. They wrote for you. The world doesn't exist for academics and scientists. It exists for you. So go out and look at it and think about it. We create it. Yeah. Here, I want to read a chunk and see if I can get through it without crying. There is no fact, no event in our private history which shall not sooner or later lose it at, lose its adhesive inert form and astonish us by soaring from our body into the Empyrean. Cradle and infancy, school and playground, the fear of boys and dogs and ferals, the love of little maids and berries and many other fact that once filled the whole sky are gone already. Friend and relative, profession and party, town and country, nation and world must also soar and sing. He wants us to take every single aspect of ourselves and convert it into thought and put it forth. 
it's a high calling. It's uh, if you take his view of human nature, I don't suppose you have to agree with every detail of Emersonian philosophy, but as he would have told you, a foolish consistency is a hobgoblin of a little mind. Who cares, right? The general thrust of it. He'd be like, at least you're thinking. I think it's what he'd say. Yeah. Is, this part three is beautiful. He says, you have to act. And then when you contemplate your actions, then you create pure thought. And then next, he says, the pure thought has to be, well, it doesn't have to be, but he exhorts us to really to write and to, and to record it somehow. Yeah. He who has put forth his total strength in fit actions has the richest return of wisdom. And he wants us to transplant that. Yeah, so I like the phrase he had, life is our dictionary. So if you don't do stuff, you don't know anything. We're just reading so much of this. You guys need to read it yourself. You know, mm -hmm. uh, life lies behind us as the quarry from whence we get tiles and copestones for the masonry of today. This is the way to learn grammar. Colleges and books only copy the language which the field and the workyard made. So uh, you go to college and you, you learn grand theories of everything. It's the outgrowth of the activity of daily human life. We are wagging the dog nowadays. Culture is made in the field and in the workyard. Real culture, that's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. That's where the cuisine comes from, the dialect, the myth and story, Paul Bunyan. You know, mm -hmm. that's where it comes from. It, but but now it comes from the metropolis and it's manufactured and it's a it's a for profit product. Yeah, you have to turn the TV on to see the what you're supposed to care about today. And it's gross. Real culture and the real language comes from action in the field and in the workyard. I 100% believe that. And then he says, you don't have to be inspired. Just live. And it's there anyway. So what then is the job of the scholar after all of this? It's to become man thinking. Right. The office of the scholar is to cheer, to raise, and to guide men by showing them facts amidst appearances. Okay, so this is, if you are the scholar, this is what you can do. Maybe a little bit better than the farmer, but you better know about farming. He says a little bit later in that paragraph, uh, the scholar, he is the world's eye, he is the world's heart. You're the one, if you are capable of doing this, you're the one that's going to see the bigger patterns and reveal things to everybody else. That's what you should be. It, it's... <sighs> Rather, boy, I just get so frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> he says only the, the scholar can see the real truth because he knows the world. The world of any moment is the merest appearance. Some great decorum, some fetish of a government, some ephemeral trade or war or man is cried up by half mankind and cried down by the other half as if all depended on this particular up or down. The odds are that the whole question is not worth the poorest thought which the scholar has lost in listening to the controversy. He knows what's important and what's real. You left out the best sentence. Let him not quit his belief that a pop gun is a pop gun, though the ancient and honorable of the earth affirm it to be the crack of doom. Mm. So it's you're purple. stuck in <laughs> you're stuck in the world of appearances. And I don't watch television anymore. I'm done with it. Occasionally, I have to take my car in for service. And you sit there in the waiting room, and they have the television on, and it's the view, or it's I don't know what the shows are called anymore, whatever the daytime shows are. And they're showing you, I'm making scare quotes, artists whom you're supposed to care about and politicians you're supposed to care about and issues of the day that you're supposed to be enraged about. And it's all garbage. None of it matters nearly as much as your own character. Yep. And our farmer scholar knows that. Yeah. Because what matters is the crop yield and the rainfall. And your family. And truth. Yeah. So the genuine scholar knows that. The fake scholar is, is part of the deal, telling you what you should care about. Yeah, the fake scholar is producing a product for you to consume. We don't consume, we create. If we're Emersonian, we create. And he says um, that when we create, and we create from our own action, and then the contemplation on the action, that people then... They drink his words because he fulfills for them their own nature. The deeper he dives into his privatist, secretist presentment, to his wonder he finds this is the most acceptable, most public, and universally true. The people delight in it. The better part of every man feels, this is my music. This is myself. 
Yeah. When I read Shakespeare, and I, I like the sonnets best, it's like he wrote it for me. Hank Williams, we, you wrote my life. <laughs> uh, well, Hank Williams, too, you know? Uh, country music. I was watching the, the documentary on country music that Ken Burns did. I'm, I'm most of the way through it. And they're talking about Merle Haggard, speaking of Oklahoma. And Dwight Yoakam is reciting lyrics to a Merle Haggard song and he chokes up in the middle of it and he can't finish because it's so true even though Merle wasn't writing about Dwight Yoakam three chords in the truth it's universally true and it's applicable to everybody it's authentic and it's from real experience this good art so this is the part of the show. This is going to become a regular segment where Hambrick shits on Jackson Pollock, <laughs> <laughs> or, or or just what or just whatever modern art. Like, where do you see where do you see the personal, authentic human experience bubble up in fill in the blank? I just don't see it. Or transgressive stuff, Maplethorpe. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in that. I want to see a selective and wonderful and insightful depiction of real human experience. Mm -hmm. Well, let me counteract you. Let, let, me, let me oppose you. Fight, fight. Okay. So what if you say, I'm the modern artist and I am giving you the truth and the truth is ugly. That's okay. That's okay. But for Hambrick... <laughs> <laughs> my my theory of aesthetics, I mean, I said it's a selective representation. It has to be representative. I mean, it doesn't have to be photorealistic, mm -hmm. but Miro or these things that have no form, we don't know what they're communicating. So you think art needs to have a direction? It needs to have a direction, and it needs to be representative, I believe. It doesn't have to be, you know, Norman Rockwell photorealistic painting, but it needs to have it needs to have form. So Patsy Cline walking after midnight, looking for you. Mm -hmm. It's not a happy song. Nope. Is it good art? Yep. Why? Because we know exactly what's pointing to, and it comes from some, and we and we can relate to the personal experience and reference of that artist. I don't know who wrote that, by the way. I don't know if she did or not. Yeah, I would say it's different this way. So the modern art, I don't know that it's pointing to anything i think it's saying look here's a whole bunch of ugly stuff and it might be doing it to normalize it it might be doing it to make it yeah just regular yeah that's the transgressive piece like we're, we're going to move the overton window we're going to make that which was unacceptable acceptable which i don't think that patsy klein which dear yeah. listener you ought to go listen to by the way that's not what that song's doing. It's the woman who is upset that the man is, is straying and is going looking for him. Well, he shouldn't ought to do that. You know, the song is not saying this is okay. It's saying it's not okay. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's pointing to ugliness, but it's not pointing to ugliness as the norm. Yeah. It's a very optimistic view of human nature that Emerson has. It's, he wants you to do more than you, can, than you are doing. And I think Emersonian art would probably be the same way. Emersonian philosophy and thought would be the same way. It, just like Socrates standing in the square and encouraging people, mm -hmm. you know, be better. That's what he's doing in yeah. front of a hostile audience, too, would be my guess. At Harvard? Yeah. <laughs> I like this a lot. He could have written this yesterday. It is a mischievous notion that we are come late into nature and the world was finished a long time ago. Why do you like that so much? I think there's a common perception now that maybe the world wasn't finished a long time ago or that we were coming late into nature, but that we are the pinnacle of human achievement. And that it's all downhill? Or, I don't think so. I think, a lot, I think most people think that this is the best culmination of everything that has come before. We're at the apex or that there is an apex coming that we're working towards something. I mean, the mm -hmm. idea of a progressive project ideally would be that you're progressing towards something. Yeah. Well, what are we progressing toward? Well, I don't know. They never say that. Yeah. You, you say, well, when will we be done? When will right. the progress be done? I don't know. 
it will always be something else. So for Emerson in 1837, he's perceiving that people think that the world was finished a long time ago. And I think we live in a, in a world where most people think that we are continuing to pro progress towards something. Something. I, I don't hear people say this, what he says here. I don't hear people utter that or act that way much anymore. Right. So I, I want to point to something that I really liked, and I bet you underlined it too. I believe man has been wronged. He's wronged himself. He's almost lost the light that can lead him back to his prerogatives. Men are become of no account. Men in history, men of the world today, are bugs, are spawn, and are called the mass and the herd. Yep, I did. That's not what you're for. That's not what you are. You're not a bug. Bug can, man. Yeah. Yeah, he says um, in a century or in a millennium, one or two men... What are two approximations to the right state of man would exist? He's, he's really worried about us losing that, this. He's really worried about all becoming bugs, spawn, the mass, the herd. Me too. Yeah, so let me do one more. We, we're doing so many quotes from this. You should. It's short. It's like 20 oh, it's pages. So good. Yeah, if you haven't read any Emerson, you should go read some Emerson. This is like 40 Eight years after they signed the Constitution that he wrote this. Yeah. And he's worried. I mean, I don't, I don't think he's a pessimistic guy. I don't know if worry. He has concern. He was concerned enough about this to write about, to, to write the speech and deliver it in front of an august body. Well, so what, what was the nation like in 1837? Quick growth. Quick growth. Western expansion. Huge economic growth. Monroe Doctrine already. Yeah. Um, you could get swept up into the mere details of of heading west and making a whole bunch of money, which is not a bad thing, you know, to make a whole bunch of money. Industrialization is underway. It's the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. So here's a quote that, that I like uh, a whole lot. Men s such as they are are very, very naturally seek money or power and power because it is as good as money, the spoils so-called of office. And why not? For they aspire to the highest, and this, in their sleepwalking, they dream is highest. So pause right there. So people are after money, fine, but they think that that's the highest thing because they're sleepwalking. And then Emerson goes on, wake them, and they shall quit the false good and leap to the true, and leave governments to clerks and desks. This revolution is to be wrought by the gradual domestication of the idea of culture, the main enterprise of the world for splendor, for extent, is the upbuilding of a man. I like this, the, the domestication of culture. We, this, is, this poetry, this stuff that we're reading, this is not for the weird people in the universities. This is feral culture. <laughs> it's for you. It's for everybody. It's yeah. the whole point of living is, is this production of a human being, a real, in German, a, a real mensch, hmm. you know, a real human, rather than a clerk or a mere clerk the revolution is to be wrought by the gradual domestication of the idea of culture i think this is a reaction to europe as, as well you know I, there was probably i can imagine in new england in 1835 1837 people thought that culture came from england and france and germany i can imagine that that's that there was a little brother kind of attitude you know here in the u.s sure and in europe i think the culture would come from the top down yeah. So it's the nobility who paid for the paintings and built the fancy stuff. And it's different here. But here he says, the revolution is to be wrought by the gradual domestication of the idea of culture. The home, the main enterprise of the world for splendor, for the upbuilding of man, the building materials are strewn along the ground. Yeah. It's there for you to pick up. You know, I feel like we could just sit here and read the whole essay out loud. <sighs> He's so good. Carl, he says, um, a man rightly viewed comprehendeth the particular natures of all men. Each philosopher, each bard, each actor has only done for me as by a delegate what one day I can do for myself. And that's what we're trying to do. There's more to life, probably, than what you're doing. For most of us, I'd say that's the case. There's more to life than what I'm doing. I'm trying. Yeah. But you got to try. The arrow points up. Yeah. 
Carl, we've been going, we've been cooking here for an hour. I could do another hour. <laughs> I, I really could. A man shall treat with man as a sovereign state with a sovereign state, he says. And that will tend to true union as well as greatness. He's just so American. Yes, this is unique. The idea, the idea of the individual as a sovereign state who has to take care of his own enculturation. Mm. Well, this is American in 1837. Whether it is now, it's up to you know. You guys can decide. But yeah, I wrote in the in the margin here, contra Hobbes, where uh, there is one sovereign, and it ain't you, and it ain't you. Well, is there anything else? There's a little chunk here at the bottom that I thought we might even ought to adopt for our motto. But before we get to that, did you have anything else you wanted to? Oh, I I got a bunch of things highlighted. You know, I can. Let's get it. Oh, I just want to read the last bit. Okay, let's. I just want to read the last sentence. If you do the things that he's encouraging to you to do, a nation of men will, for the first time, exist. Because each believes himself inspired by the divine soul, which also inspires all men. If we did this right, that's what he's hoping. If you do this American project right, you'll have the first nation that actually has real human beings in it. People who own their own minds, you know, that collection of individual sovereigns. That's the idea. That's a heck of an idea. I, I'd i like to try it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I read Plato and think of Athens at that time, my notion of it is like that. You know, how many people were in Athens when Socrates was walking around? 25,000? Maybe. Everything was smaller then. Not a lot of people. And he's got a lot of good interlocutors, you know. Just the, if there's 20, if there are 25,000 people in Athens at that time, just to know that there were as many people talking about those things are as are represented in the dialogues means like there was a lot there was a lot of moving and shaking going on in that little town mm -hmm. when I think of it, I think of it as being a divine state in that way like he's talking about, and that's just yeah. a half a dozen guys uh or now nah, there's probably more than two dozen guys in those dialogues out of twenty five thousand It seems like they all know each other too they did. Yeah, we, we had a shot at that. I say had. Was that a slip? Uh, well, how long did Athens last? 300 years? Well, but the Athens as free democracy lasted maybe 80. Okay? The, the golden age of Athens is an, a turbulent age that ends in its destruction as its own power. Okay? It doesn't have a happy ending. So we could be a little critical of this and say your idea of individual sovereigns living together in a nation of true men of, of true you know full human beings it's not sustainable no it's not we got about 85 years out of it so it, maybe this is just a happy fairy tale but it's one that i want to have be true yeah it's one i think should be true i think it's it's like human beings at their best people who are are th actually thinking Aristotle says that uh, happiness is rational activity in accord with virtue. And it's rational activity because rational activity is the highest activity of a human being. I don't know how many of us actually do rational activity. I try. You know, you wake up, you eat, you turn on the news, you, you get mad at the things they tell you to get mad at, you go to bed. How much thinking was there? I would like there to be more. It'd be more fun. <laughs> I was going to say it'd be better. I think it'd be better. I think it'd be more fun. Framing a house is a rational activity. If you get irrational, it falls down. You know, that rooting in reality, if you get irrational, it doesn't work. That's true. I see what you're saying here. So if you're not actually doing, um, if your action consists of daydreaming, sleepwalking, acting of, out of fear, working for somebody else for a low-pressure job, Probably your encounter with actual reality is a little bit low because it yeah. doesn't really matter what you do. People that weld pressure vessels can't play around. Yes. So I was trying, that's good. I was trying to figure out a little bit more from my own understanding why Emerson thinks action is so important. That's back to that thing I mentioned about that John Sr. I mean, yeah. he, he's taught me that, you know, this deep engagement with the physical 
forms the mind and trains the mind for better and more careful thought. We see this in barbell training too. Yeah. You know, it gets you out of uh, the mere thinking because there's 405 pounds on the ground and you got to pick it up. And so it roots you more in reality, I think. Going out and doing something, taking a risk, getting skin in the game, means that your thinking has to be better. I have a barbell coaching client who is a law student and his weights are starting to get heavy. He just thinks, 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 thinks about it. And I told him the other day, I was like, you're not that smart. And you're, <laughs> and you're thinking about all of the wrong things. The only thing you have to think about is setting your back and pushing the floor like you're going to fucking die. That's it. Because everything else is fake. Most all, of it, a lot of it's fake. Yeah. The, the rest of it's phantasm. The only thing is setting his back and pushing the floor away until he locks it out. And he just lives in a fantasy world. I'm so tired of him. I just want to just, I just want to punch him in the face. <laughs> I've told him that. That would be an encounter with reality. Well, it's all rubbish. And it's all, he doesn't know it, but it's all an excuse to not get it done. He's being a barbell scholar. A mere scholar? Yes, re rather than, than a man training. He's somebody thinking about training. Yeah. And uh, it just drives me nuts. So here's what I thought might ought to be our unofficial motto. Okay. It's just before what you read. We will walk on our own feet. We will work with our own hands. We will speak our own minds. The study of letters shall be no longer a name for pity, for doubt, and for sensual indulgence. I like it. I need to go work with my own hands then. I got to do something. Hmm. I did make a banjo. That's good. That was fun. What's next? I was looking up, because pedal harps are $10,000, I was mm. looking up. You can't build your own pedal harp. No, that's crazy. No, you need a machine shop. You need to figure out linkages. There's, there's too many people. You can't do that. You can make a harp. You can make a lever harp. That's not very hard. But no, I don't think I can make a pedal harp. There's this uh, There's a show on that was on Ireland Public Television in the 70s. I watched a few episodes of it. Did you see the guy making the lyre? No, I, mostly I saw the, the wool and then the yeah. quilt making. Those are the, the two I saw. The show is called Hands, and it's about people that build stuff with their hands. You know, people that re do real things. And there's a guy that makes these Irish, you know, liars, like the one you see on the can of Guinness, you know. And uh, they've been making them that way since the Vikings. And, uh, you know, he goes and selects a tree and cuts the thing down and then buries it in a bog. <laughs> And uh, he's, if I remember correctly, when he's ready to build another one, he goes and digs up a tree that his dad buried in the bog. Wow. So the trees that he buries, he will never use them. I need to get to that episode. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, because uh, something about that bog water and uh, the mineralization of the wood and yeah. you know, whatever. I don't know. It's some of that Stradivarius hocus pocus stuff, you know, that makes it sound just right. Yeah. Well, you've talked before about how you like for, like in a proper neighborhood, at least a neighborhood that you'd like, that everybody's known as something. You know, mm -hmm. well, there's the car guy, you know, and, right, right. and well, that guy builds liars and oh, she, she makes pies and they're the best, you know, that everybody has a thing that you do. It used to be that way. You should have a thing that you do and that's your connection to reality. And it's not always going to be the same thing. We are diverse. And your thing will change maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what you're talking about is I've I've said that uh like in the seventies and eighties, certainly before that, like everybody had hobby hobbies. Like that guy's a ham radio guy and, yeah. and then Mr. Jenkins, he's he builds ships in a bottle. Have you seen those ships that, that guy he spends hours on those so many people had those things. And now they just binge watch X, whatever it is. And bleh, bleh. Cancel your Netflix, go get a hobby. Yeah. Learn how to do something. That's like the best part of the internet would be you go to mm. your your video supplier and you type in how to build a liar. And there's a video of somebody building a liar and you say, oh, I want to do that. You know, or how to forge iron. Mm. I have this friend that I met almost 25 years ago. And he was my the age I am now then. When I first encountered this guy, he was into 
this technology scaffolding thing where guys would say, I'm going to build a a, a 9 sixteenths bolt with 20 pitch threads. Just pick something. Okay. And they'll just go out in the woods and start from nothing. (laughs) Like break a a, a limb off of a tree and just start, start scratching at the ground and then build a little lathe, a wooden lathe, and they, they build a wooden screw to make the wooden lathe more accurate, and blah, 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 and then eventually you have to find some ore, and they'll cheat a little bit. They'll buy some raw ore, and then they'll have to smelt something, and then blah, blah, blah. It, it, you just start from nothing, like man did. Of course, we had the benefit mm-hmm. of some books and some other institutional knowledge and stuff, but that's, that's what his hobby was, would be just to start from nothing and then re-resurrect all the technology it would take to build some simple thing to a, a specific tolerance. Mm-hmm. That's what he was doing. And when I, and he was, and he had built at that time, he had built a gingery lathe, J I N G E E no G I N G E R Y. You can go look that up on YouTube. There's a guy named gingery and he just shows you how to make a lathe from nothing. It's astounding. People do crazy stuff. All your ancestors did this stuff. Yeah. And I was just thinking as you're talking, uh, the, the next dinner party you go, that you go to, um, rather than talking about the NFL or what's good on Netflix, you're sitting around talking to each other. You know what I did? I made a gingery lathe. Oh, yeah? Well, I made some bronze. I got some tin and some copper and I... I whatever else goes into bronze, and I made some bronze in the backyard. That's neat. I had to fight my way all across Gaul so I could get to Britain and get Get some tin. tin. Yeah. Well, maybe a mail order the tin, but (laughs) I I think that that'd be so much fun. Uh, we we got a guy at our gym that has taken up – I mentioned baking. He has taken up baking desserts, and he Mm. makes – the most fantastic stuff. I think there's a stick of butter in every cupcake that he makes. Mm. It's really, really good, but not overly sweet. And this is his hobby. He works in software somewhere. They all work in software. Uh, and he's got a kid on the way, but he's learning how to bake. And he's real serious about it. And it, it's fun to talk to him about it. And he brings it in sometimes. We get to eat it. It's something real that he's doing. And I, I really appreciate that. Something I've wanted to take up as a hobby and, and never have done is um, get the original Julia Child's uh, cookbook. Was it Mastering the Art of French Cooking? Something like and that. And just yeah. do everything in it. Just do everything in it. Because supposedly, she very carefully teaches you all of the basic French cooking skills that that you need to know. And you, it scaffolds upon itself. And so I've got a copy of it, and that's something that I've thought about doing, and I've never done that. Can, but, I mean, how much would you learn about how everything works. I'll be over for dinner at six. How, how awesome would that be? <laughs> Can you get fresh lobster in Oklahoma? Yeah. Fly them all into Tulsa International Airport. <laughs> all that stuff is great. You know, learn an instrument, do something. Here's another thing that makes me cry, Carl. Uh-oh. I went to the Smithsonian th- three, four years ago in the, uh, mu- in the Museum of uh, American History. Julia Child's kitchen is in there have i told you this story i maybe they just plucked it out of her home after her death and reconstructed it there and there's like plexiglass and you can look in and walk all around it and she was six foot tall you know she was a tall lady and i I think she was six foot two yeah and you know and just serious as a heart attack about her job and that kitchen it's the form follows the function, you know. She was so serious about what she did, and she's uh, she's tall, so all the cabinets are tall. Like, it's her, you know. It it, it was just her, and I just cried, and cried, and cried. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. People are like, "Why is this guy crying about this lady's kitchen?" <laughs> well, she's a craftsman, and she was excellent, and she cared. That's why, and it kills me dead every time. Yes. I like looking at the pottery. At the Art Institute of Chicago, mm. we have a whole bunch of ancient Greek pottery. 
and different styles. And you can see the progression and the degradation of the art. And it's the same thing. You're looking at this pot, which has a, it's just a pot for olive oil or something. Right. And it, but it's got a picture of Achilles on it that's inlaid. I don't know how to do it, but it's like one of those guys at Lion and Healy that I saw today. Ordinary Joe, Ordinary Jane, doing a job, making a piece of beauty that somebody did 3,000 years ago. Yep. And there it is. Demetrius, or whoever it was, in Athens back then, <laughs> is not thinking that he's making great art, but he was. He was just a guy making pots. That's back when Demetrius's were potters and not running backs. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're named after the goddess of grain. Hmm. The Divine Mother, Demeter. Well, let me bring Julia Child back to Emerson, and then we'll put a bow on it. All right. She acted. She went to school. She cooked. She mastered the thing. She took her experience with that, which was distinctly French. Her brain reorganized it. She regurgitated it in her own way and made that stuff immortal. And there were people, you know what cooking in America was like in the 50s? That's where Miracle Whip came from, mm -hmm. and J-E-L-L-O, and all that stuff. And she took the product of the past minds and made it fresh and made it interesting and made it good. Well done. That's what she's supposed to do. Well, there's another online great books podcast. We already asked you to go leave a review. Go do that, and go read... Uh, the American Scholar. It's a lecture or a speech that he gave to some folks at Harvard in 1837. And uh, do you think he knew we'd read it? <laughs> My sense is Emerson probably thought I'm a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> I think he did too. He's right. He was right. Uh, what are we going to read next, Carl? If anybody's trying to stay a up with us, what are we reading next? Uh, I just ordered a little book uh, that we talked about before that I think we ought to read at least some of, which is Joseph Pieper's Leisure, The Basis of Culture. I was thinking we probably ought to read some Henry David Thoreau at some point. You know that. Yeah, I like this American thing we're doing. We ought to dig some more of that up. The Anti-Federalist Papers? Do we have to read the Federalist Papers, or are we only going to read the Anti? The on we only are going to read the Anti. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Federalist Papers get all the, you know, because we're, we're, we're educated by the federal government, uh -huh. they're the only ones that get any play. I bet 80% of people don't even know there's there is the anti-federalist papers we ought to pick a bunch of these american things to look at i think eventually um ben franklin the self-promoting but still very cool autobiography of ben franklin mm -hmm. where he's got his virtue checklist i think that's interesting yeah yeah what else from early american literature the articles of confederation do we read some cotton mather sure this crazy calvinist bomb throwing stuff <laughs> Yeah, well, that's stuff that deserves to be remembered. It's where we came from. Yep. Uh, somebody's got to read it. Might as well be us. And one of the things I, I wanted to bring up and didn't, all of Emerson's talk about work and action, how does that stand in relationship with that Puritan work ethic? He's in Massachusetts. I mean, he's right there. Not too long after the witch <laughs> <laughs> the mm -hmm. witch trials. I wonder. So I'm thinking that reading Pieper's book on leisure might be a, an interesting counterpoint to Emerson's glorification of work. Let's do it. That's yeah. next. Uh, Joseph Pieper. P-I-E-P-E-R. What's the top, full title there, Carl? Leisure, the Basis of Culture. All right. I'm on it. Let's do it. We'll get it. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you in another week. But you've already had a Thanksgiving, but I hope it was a good one anyway. Looking forward to pumpkin pie. Nope. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye. So gross. Mush. Mush.